Greetings. Thank you, everyone, for coming out to our group author reading on this hot, hot night. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women, Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented, underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our twice monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided in the chat and by visiting our website, a link to which will be added in the chat real soon now. Uh, and the website is https strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. I'm your host today, Sarah Smith, and you can find out more about me and other Strong Women Strange Worlds um, steering people about the provided in the provided handout as well. Please note that recording of this session by the audience is not allowed and recording of electronic communications, including Zoom meetings and webinars without permission is illegal. And we do post these Zoom sessions afterward. So don't be concerned that you'll miss anything. Um, we have a YouTube channel and you can, you can see many of the wonderful authors who have read previously right there. Today we'll be featuring six authors, Marissa Lingen, Karen Gustav Sumchin, Maya Dean, Vanessa McLaren Way, Ray, Lisa Stringfellow, and Mia V. Mass. Each author will have eight minutes to read. Our first reader is Marissa Lingen. Marissa Lingen writes short science fiction and fantasy, essays, and poems. She lives in the Minneapolis area. Marissa, take it away. Great. So this story appeared in Nature in November of 2018. It's called Say It With Mastodons. It is completely implausible people should fall in love with each other, but of course they do. I mean, we do, even I do apparently, although it makes no sense to me. The perfectly logical reasons why I should like you, not being enough, although I can see no reason why they shouldn't be, that I should be weirdly tender to in addition to all of the ordinary human respect and, damn it, liking that you inspire and make, that I should not only think of you often, but smile a weird, wobbly smile when I do, that I should care so much all of a sudden about little things that make you happy, about how your week is going, about the way you read things over the top of your glasses, and the way your eyes crinkle up when you smile. It's far more specific than a general fondness, very intense. It doesn't make any sense, even though most people do it. It's pretty weird, and I really don't know what to do about it. So I made you some mastodons. I don't think this is just a me thing. I think it's an us thing. As much as I understand falling in love as a thing, part of it is that there are so many us things, like mastodons. Or more to the point, like soil restoration on the Northern Great Plains. We've talked about it so many times, sometimes in our labs, and sometimes in charming cafes with thoughtfully concocted beverages, and sometimes in tree-lined parks. We talk a lot. We talk about this, about how we both grew up in small towns in the Dakotas, you outside Watertown, me in Wapiton, close enough to marvel at now that we're not there about how hope rose in us, in strange, half-understood little kid ways, when the grazing program to restore the soil really took off, when the crop yield went up and the air smelled of wet, green, growing things. Even though we didn't know each other then, we remembered how it was. We knew. So we both knew the difference when the black leg hit it, when climate change made its season longer and mutation made it rage on. We knew what those farms could have been, what they were struggling to be in the newfound heat and tornadoes. They struggled 
they stumbled, and we came of age, separately but together, with the dusty chemical smell of failure around us. We both went east for school, like so many people. We both turned away. Neither of us could help looking back. And then we found each other. And then all the conversations, while the black legs spread, cow and bison, while no one could figure out what to do about it. And then I fell in love with you, and I didn't know what to do. And I thought of where we're from. I thought of the things we'd turned over in conversation, the tread of cattle on the plains, the natural fertilizer, the way it had all gone so right before it went so wrong. I know we're both focused on conservation, but the conservation attempts weren't getting the prairie anywhere. We needed another more radical solution. And also being in love with you turned my brains upside down and then right side up again. And so I thought, mastodons, just little ones, not much over half a ton. Compared to their ancestors, that's small and manageable, but when you don't expect mastodons, it's still a lot. Kind of like falling in love when a person didn't plan to, I guess. It's fun to collaborate, so I left it to you to figure out what trees the farmers should plant their field borders for the mastodons to browse when they're not grazing. Almost anything would be okay, but surely there are some that they'll like best. Mastodons like soft shoots and fresh leaves in the spring. They're surprisingly focused on tenderness, although I shouldn't be surprised by anybody that way after recent developments. They're still good grassland maintainers though. I'm pretty sure they should be. The lab tests show their manure to be rich and fertile and nitrogen fixing. They've had a lot to process these mastodons. I can relate. I made them black leg resistant, at least as much as anyone can ever be sure they're resistant to anything. They haven't responded to any of the fatal strains that are common now. So we can hope for at least a reprieve, some quiet time to do their job without worrying about new developments. Wouldn't that be nice? Anyway, here's the key. I hope you want to visit them since I Uh-oh. I made them for the place we came to for you. It's scary, but they're intensely... Even though it took almost two years just to gestate them. So I guess I've been squirming about this for some time. I'm sorry if I'm making you squirm alongside me. That's one of the things I actually don't want to share. It's okay if you don't want to talk about the love part. I like them best. Well, best except for you. Uh. Well, assuming that you can still hear me, I thought since I probably have a minute or two left, then I would give you a poem around the similar theme, which is prehistoric animals and, and love. So here's Chalk and Carbon, which uh, was in Asimov's in the November, December issue of last year. Long distance relationships are hard. I in the geared and rackety Holocene, you in the green and humid Cretaceous, reaching out through granite and long receded sea. You send a your news. I wonder if the pigeons will last long enough to spare one in return, but we're together in our bones, together in our roar. I know the startling brilliance of your feathers, but also your inmost essential shape. You cradle my mammalian entrails with care and in chalk and carbon, in everything that lasts and all that falls away, we are for each other in the teeth of space and time. Thank you so much for bearing with me uh, and for my technology issues. Thank you for listening. And I do have a giveaway in the form, so please sign up for that if you would like more short work and now i will turn it over to somebody who ideally will have an easier time of it thanks guys <laughs> marissa thank you so much for bearing up under under technology issues and thank you for your beautiful story our second reader is karen gusoff sumption karen gusoff sumption is a science fiction writer 
of mixed Romani ancestry living near Seattle. She's the author of six books, the setting chapter in the Gotham Writers Workshop Practical Guide, and more than 100 short stories. Her latest novella will be out in September from Vernacular Books. Karen, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is actually the very first time I'm reading from the upcoming novella in public. So you guys are getting a super sneak preview. Uh, the novella is called So Quick Bright Things Come to Confusion. It is a deep space, far future, uh, Elizabethan style comedy of manners. And I'm going to read a few pages from the very beginning. Um, I do have a giveaway, so please sign up. Um, I'll be giving away electronic arcs of the novella. And again, you're getting them even before book reviewers are getting them. So the only people that have seen these are my blurbers. So sign up. Thank you. Okay, I'll start. One. Avalyn doesn't understand golf, so I show her Caddyshack. I'll take any excuse to watch Caddyshack. I'm kind of an expert on historical comedies, and Caddyshack was one of the best. It's on my list for top 10. It isn't my number one. She isn't ready for that yet. All season, I've been laying the groundwork slowly and surely to finally share the best and funniest comedy of all time, of the 20th to 25th century anyway. But we aren't quite there yet. We did get onto golf. I, I love golf. And when I showed her my great plus plus grandfather's pitching wedge, she wasn't very impressed. So Caddyshack it is. Sit still, I tell her, this is great. Avalyn stares at Chevy Chase. Then she stares at me, laughing at Chevy Chase. Finally, she slaps her tail on the floor. Muh, she says. Her tail is heavy with stored water, so the slap shakes the couch. I pause the movie. I explain country clubs, caddies, gophers, and getting laid. I tell her about the Dalai Lama, wasps, and the Viet Cong. I replay her scenes to illustrate the concepts as I describe cheeseburgers, hot dogs, salami, and potato chips. My chip flashes notes to me in the corner of my eye. And I take my time explaining Scotland in particular because that's the groundwork for later, but she needs to understand golf first. Here I say, we'll both play. I don't have a lot of personal possessions. I wouldn't say I'm usually sentimental, but this wedge is something special. I found it in my mother's attic and she let me keep it. I didn't like the dark as a kid and she thought that was cute, but inconvenient. So she let me sleep with the club next to me. Then I outgrew monsters, but I kept it because it made me interesting. No one else I knew had a golf club or knew how to play. And I did, and I learned. It's a great meditation. I hand the club to Avalyn. She sniffs it, licks it, and then holds it under her arm as I restart the movie. I give her credit. She tries to follow along gamely, but then Avalyn stares hard at me and thumps her tail on the floor. Ma, she repeats. For emphasis, she adds, Zaya Ma, thumping her tail harder. And then, as if I could possibly miss how much she doesn't understand, she shakes her head like she's got swimmer's ear. Avalyn and I have been together down here for more than a month. She has a sense of humor and gets most things, even if not right away. But we're at the Caddy Day tournament, and I love this part. Give it a chance, I ask. She makes an unhappy noise. I'm not surprised, really. Every girl I've ever shown Caddyshack to hated it, and I say so. Well, I sigh, where I come from, not many women like this movie either. Zaya not a woman, Avalyn reminds me. So says you, 
I say. Avalyn gives up on me. She lays the wedge next to me and takes one of the golf balls I'd printed back on the ship and she dribbles it back and forth with her tail. I pause again and watch her. Her tail looks really painful to me. It's swollen, her skin stretched white between the dark green scutum. But she hits the golf ball like it doesn't seem to bother her. I'll up a diuretic in her evening shots. I'll get the water out. I blink twice. My chip says it's late afternoon. The sun's only set slightly below the horizon in summer. So at this time of year, it always feels like any time. I want to watch the rest of this, I say, and I point up so she knows that I mean it. Ka, she says. She whacks the ball around as she paces, stopping only to give me a dirty look. Not a woman, my ass. She's not going to let me finish Caddyshack in peace. Careful, I say, what's up with you today? Avalyn thumps her tail. Azayama. I do understand. The days are too long and too bright, and there's only the two of us waiting. It's hard to be patient. But I agree with her. No, I don't understand. And just like that, she softens, just like a woman. She touches her stomach in apology. ZZ, I say, pointing up, we're still friends. Pals, she says, which she's picked up from the movie. I'm a little proud, and I smile. She responds, baring her big teeth at me, a pantomime of a human smile. Then she goes to sit at the far window. From where I sit, I can't tell if she's looking at her reflection or out into the blurry heat. I decide she's looking out. Her lips are moving. I know what she's doing. She's rehearsing what to say, how she'll describe all of this. She's the only one of her kind to ever see the summer in its entirety. And they expect to hear everything when they wake up. It's an enormous responsibility and it rests on her heavily. The movie is almost over. Come here, I say, patting the couch. Watch to the end. Avalyn turns from the window. She doesn't sit next to me though. Instead, she settles close to the screen, back onto her haunches, propped up by her tail. She's quiet for a while, then asks me to pause the movie. I do. Bill Murray's face takes up the whole screen and she reaches out and strokes his cheek. I like the texture of his face, she says in English. It's like drying mud. <laughs> well, I say, I hit play again and stretch out. That's something, isn't it? Thank you. The texture of his face like drying mud. Yeah. Looking forward to this then, and we can all be part of the, the early readers. Very early. Thank you very, so much. Very, very early readers. Thank our, you. Our third reader is Maya Dean. Maya Dean is a novelist, visual artist, and trans women. She loves to talk about the history of forks, cannabis hotboxing Amazons in the archaeological record, the top three most famous 18th century French trans women, and more. She's a graduate of the Rutgers Camden MFA in creative writing. Maya, it's all yours. Oh gosh, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, Maya. Um, so yeah, uh, where I'm gonna read for Math Goddess Sing, basically at this point in the story, um, Achilles has lived as a woman named Pyrrha for years and has finally joined the Trojan War. She's left the island of Skiros and her former lover, Deodamia. She's been reunited with her beloved cousin, Patroclus, and has befriended his Egyptian wife, Mariapi. She's joined the Achaean army. She's slept with Agamemnon, which is no bueno. And she's killed a bunch of men in her first battle. Now she and her friends have been sent behind enemy lines on a diversionary raid. 
The sun rose over the hills of Oshawa and shone through the sparse pines of gently rolling Dardania. Sunlight gleamed on the brass of Patroclus' helmet and glowed red in his beard and in the wisps of hair that escaped from under the cheek guards of his helm. Achilles gathered the reins of Patroclus' chariot horses, Stenile and Polymile, around her waist and tied them carefully, then lifted the chariot shield into place, the better to protect herself and her precious archer. She caught Patroclus' eye, and they smiled at each other without thinking, prompted by the same secret joy. Achilles had woken up hours before with the question, what is love? As she had strapped on her armor and trudged down to the ships, she realized that she did not know the answer. A month before she would have said, love is Deidamia, and yet... On the ship, she asked Diomedes and Odysseus and Patroclus. Diomedes said, love is shared duty, and explained that he could trust his cousin and wife, Agelia, with the throne of Argos in his absence, for they were bred from the same stock and born from the same soil. She had chosen him king. Their interests were one. That was love. But his mistress Laodike he had not loved, only desired for her golden hair and her silver laugh and her skin like polished copper and her eyes like chips of tin. Odysseus had said, love is certainly not desire nor would I desire your metallic mistress, neither. Love is what my Penelope has for me. A fierce, constant obsession, the savage focus of a daughter of Perseus. Always she tries to increase our wealth, our ships, the power of our house. Her ambitions are endless. Telemachus, our son, will rule a naval empire. I have many infatuations and so does she. We like the same girls. But love is the cultivation of our land, the way we painted frescoes together in our palace, depicting our future ghosts as winged guardians over Telemachos. Love is what I feel for the silent one who plants clever schemes in my brain and constantly urges me to excellence and gives me strange dreams of the ancient world, of the cities of sacrifice, of the dreams she dreamed when she drank from the skulls of the old ones. Love is the creative force that imbues life with spirit. Achilles had watched the coast of Dardania glide by in the dark, brooding on their answers. What she had for Agamemnon was not love. It was mutual recognition and lust, a hunger to pull him into her body and draw the strength from his royal arm and tremble and laugh and glory in the sheer wonder of being herself. But it was not love. I think love is a salute between souls, Patroclus had said wistfully. In a sense, we are always alone, ships in the night crossing the wine dark sea. And yet, every now and then, we uncover our lantern and an answering lantern flickers across the waters. And we know that we are also never alone. Now they smiled at each other in the blaze of sun on bronze and the horses snorted and pawed the turf. And Odysseus called out, Achilles, use your goddess eyes, that meadow between those woods, what do you see? Achilles narrowed her eyes and looked harder. More than a hundred magnificent cattle. I think we found Anyasha's favorite cows. Shall we ride over and steal them? Give him something to worry about that's not named Agamemnon? Odysseus laughed. It's a beautiful morning for a cow raid. He sprang up on his chariot, bow in hand. His driver started him down the slope and the Islander chariots followed. A moment later, Diomedes rolled downhill in green, gleaming bronze armor inlaid with green copper boar emblems, three javelins in his hand, whispering some secret joke to his driver, Senelos. The chariots from Argos rumbled downhill after him. They left the infantry to, to guard the ships, and one by one, the Myrmidons began to roll downhill, all smoke-blacked leather and gleaming bronze and stamping Thean horses and fluttering horsehair crests. Patroclus gave a nod, and Achilles flicked the reins. 
Fenile and Polimile began to move as one. And as the car bounced and rattled down onto the flat golden plain of nodding grass and brilliant wildflowers, Achilles and Patroclos too moved as one, trimming the reins, bobbing with the chariot, never fumbling against each other, always swaying together. She loved Patroclos, she loved Meriapi, and it had nothing to do with desire, only joy. To see them was joy, to breathe with them was joy, to ride with Patroclos on a cattle raid was joy, scanning the pines for ambush was joy, holding the shield to protect them from Manyasha's arrows was joy. If she failed, they would die together, and that too was joy. There was a break in an encircling ring of trees and a golden meadow pregnant with blue tulips and yellow sunflowers and green weeds. Longhorned Egyptian cattle, each unblemished and fat and enormous, walked among the weeds, chewing the grass in their jowls. They had seemed poorly guarded from a distance, but now that Achilles was closer, she saw that they were entirely unattended. She slowed the horses. Something is not right, she murmured to Patroclos. Who would leave such rich cows alone? A trap, he agreed. No matter. If there are infantry in the meadow, we'll ride them down. And I'll stop there. It is in fact a trap and not the kind she expects. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Oh, that is marvelous. Um, to to find to find a place for women in Greek mythology, that is that particular place, the the place of warriors. Thank you. Our fourth reader is Vanessa McLaren Ray. Vanessa McLaren Ray writes speculative fiction, exploring the challenges of communication and attachment in a complex universe. Although denying any knowledge of alien technologies or extrasolar civilizations when asked to write what she knows, Vanessa gravitates toward wormhole-based transit systems and cultural matrices only partly occupied by human beings. There you go, Vanessa. I suppose that makes it my turn. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to read today from the beginning of The Smugglers, which just came out a couple of days ago from Water Dragon Publishing. Uh, so it's a little hard to avoid spoilers in an adventure story, um, but I've chosen a passage for this audience that I think, well, you folks would probably see some of these things coming a mile away, so you won't be too disappointed. All you need to know at this point is that Boy is an adolescent alien, and he and Mother are transporting a dangerous animal to a collector. It's the evening before their delivery, and they're safe in their hotel room in the truck stop at the center of the galaxy. Oh, and remember, Mother has a rule. Don't name the merchandise. Propped against a cushion, Boy peered into the shadows of the creature containment. Within, a row of glittery ovals peered back at him, four in all, though he knew that the Kretzina, like himself, had a total of five eyes on movable stalks, as well as the two that stayed fixed in place, marking its front. Hello, he whispered. Don't worry, Mama has found you a good place to go to. The eyes blinked one after another, making a moving line in the dark. A long, feathery frond snaked through the netting, and he held out one of his own. The Kretzina's little animal fingers wrapped around his endmost tendrils, the ones most sensitive to touch and warmth, and tugged at him. Boy let the Kretzina draw his finger tendril up to the wall of the cage where it could brush its mouth parts over his skin, tasting the essence of him. He held still, taking care not to pull back and injure the little thing's grasper. A name floated through his mind, a pretty name for a lovely creature. Ashaka, he whispered. You are Ashaka. 
the Kretzina stretched her frond out to touch Boy's face. Her featherings were down soft, like his mother's, and he let Ashika run her fingers over his eyebrow hairs and feel her way across each of his mouths. He kept the biting jaw tight clamped, though, and reveled at her fearless exploration. With soft breaths from mother nearby and Ashika twirling in place, bouncing a little in the soft, false gravity, boy drifted to sleep, happy. Girl woke, jumping from memory to memory of the day past, and her eyes fell immediately upon Ashika. The fuzzy white Kritzina had learned she could scale the sides of her containment and hang from the top. Hello, Ashika, girl said, and she pressed one of her fronds to the side of the cage closest to Ashika. Girl felt strange. Everything about the day had shifted to kilter. Even the shape of her own self felt odd. Not wrong, but different. The touch of Ashika's feelers on her fronds filled her with comfort, but also triggered an anxiety she couldn't put a name to. Mama? Yes, boy? Oh, it's girl now, Mama. The bedclothes rustled and mother's fronds unfurled to brush across girl's face. That feather-like touch felt strangely unfamiliar. Girl tucked a frond through the cage netting and Ashika wrapped tight tendrils around her fingertips. That's better. Well, now, my dear, none of us can choose our time now, can we? I don't know, Mama. Nothing felt right. Girl curled up tight and hunkered close to the containment. Ashika twirled a frond through the webbing and wrapped it around one of girl's legs. It tickled and a memory of laughter bubbled up. Mother said, our meeting with the client is soon, and then we will have the rest of the day to sort things out. You're all right, girl. Don't worry. Girl didn't feel all right, but she knew how important this meeting would be, so she kept quiet. Mother scuttled around, tidying up the room, then came to her with a packet of food for Ashika. I need to squeeze into my skin suit. Would you like to feed the Kretzina if it's happy and well-fed? It will stay calm while we go to the meeting. All right. Taking off a skin suit went quickly. Not so clambering into one. And mother was very fussy about having it just so. So there'd be plenty of time to feed Ashika and play with her before it was girl's turn to get dressed. Except Ashika didn't like the food. She nibbled through half a morsel, then shoved it off to the side and rubbed her fronds at her mouth, brushing away remnants. Girl picked up the rejected food and sniffed it. Ashika was right. It smelled wrong. Girl went to the case and found the leftover food from last night. Ashika liked that. She ate it all up, skittered happily around her cage for a bit, then curled up and went back to sleep. By then, Girl needed to get into her own disguise. It wasn't fair that the skin suit couldn't change from being a boy, but she would have to make do. Girl always had trouble sorting out which fronds went into which arms, and her legs had grown too long to fit the control frames for the skin suit properly. With help from mother, she was soon hopping around the room, first on one huge flat foot and then on the other with mother laughing at her antics. Girl clowned around until mother said, it's time. Mother gathered up sleepy little Ashika and bundled her into a funny little skin suit that was very nearly an android because it had no controls that the Kretzina could operate from the inside. The skin suit's face had big round eyes and was all covered in pink wrinkly skin. It made wet blurpy noises from time to time. The set girl to giggling and she tried to emulate it with her own skin suit. Blurp, blurp. Mother laughed along with her. They would fool the humans and their silly machines to achieve their goals with no harm done to anyone. Finally, Mother picked up the Kretzina's supplies into the little pink case. She carried the baby with its perfume-smelly bundling, and Girl got to pull the case. Mother led the way to the elevators and then to the Grand Mall, past the gift shop and the ice cream store, all the way to a restaurant with a dim-lit entrance right at the very edge of Green Quadrant. Tall figures there that must have been androids 
but not the nice shopkeeper kind. And they stood guard at a massive hatchway. Why it needed guarded, girl could not puzzle out. In all the languages she could read, the hatch was labeled sealed, no admittance, orange. Even orange didn't make sense. Mama, why is it orange? Mother replied, orange? I don't know, dear. Perhaps it's an appealing color or some official's proper name. The restaurant door swung inward, making not even a fraction of a smidgen of sound. Girl tapped her deck shoes a little to make a bit of noise, then followed as mother led the way inside. A tall human man, not only tall, but as wide as two men squished together, bowed to mother, and then led them through the hush of the restaurant all the way to the back, where there was a little room with just a single table and two glasses. Oh, pardon, little boy, said the wide man, giving a big android-like smile. I will bring a third glass girl wanted to protest because it wouldn't be good to upset mother in the middle of a negotiation. It's all right, she told herself. I am girl, disguised as boy, disguised as human, and Ashoka is disguised as baby, but I know who mother is, and she knows that I am girl. And I will stop there and apologize for the glitch. <laughs> I do have giveaways. I have a whole uh, cop a full copy of the novel available. And also, I have authentic truck stop keychains. <laughs> authentic truck stop keychains and a novel. Thank you so, so much. Our fifth reader is Lisa Stringfellow. Lisa Stringfellow writes middle grade fiction and has a not so secret fondness for fantasy with a dark twist. Her debut fantasy, A Comb of Wishes, is published by HarperCollins Quill Tree Books and was released on February 8th, 2022. It was named both an ABA Indie Introduce and an Indie Next kids title. Congratulations, Lisa. Her work often reflects her West Indian and Black Southern heritage. Lisa, over to you. Thank you all so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to read from the beginning. And the only thing that I feel like um, you might want a little introduction to is the beginning of chapter one starts with the words crick crack. And that's a storytelling frame that's very common in many islands in the Caribbean, kind of as a way um, to create a call and response between the audience and the storyteller. So all of the chapters um, that are told from the mermaid's point of view, my mermaid Ophidia, are, start with that. Uh, crick crack. So that's where we begin with chapter one. Chapter one, crick crack. I say crick, you say crack. Crick crack. This is a story. Down past the islands lit by the sun, beyond twilight swells of dusky sea, through midnight veils of the crushing abyss, another world hides under the waves the other side of the mirror as it's known. Through these depths swam a sea woman. The full moon rose and spilled its milk into the water and light glimmered over dark brown skin. Her scales flashed green and gold. Foreboding drifted on the tide and urged her on. When she reached the cavern, the quiet struck her first. No gentle trill greeted her as it usually did. In her hiding place, only a broken tumble of rocks and stones remained. Hope dissolved as she groped through the cavern, trembling. Her tail fin thrashed as she plunged her arms into every corner. But the silence told her that the box was gone. Her pupils narrowed to dangerous slits. The sea woman rode the cold currents into the briny deep. She would reclaim the box and what was inside, she must. Time and tides would decide. Crick, crack, the story is put on you. 
Chapter 2, Sinking Sand. The note waited on the kitchen table. Keela didn't even have to pick it up or read Pop's blocky print to know what it said. Her fingers hesitated over the paper. She and Pop hadn't gone diving or done anything normal together in months. She missed the salty mist on her face and the trampolining waves. Keela lifted the note and balled it in her fist. She took a deep breath and then shut the door of the empty house. The gravel crunched under Keela's feet as she crossed the street into the dense patch of trees. A foot-worn path wound its way between towering cabbage palms and sandbox trees. The gully sloped and she stepped around the snaking roots of a bearded fig. Leaves rustled overhead. A monkey bow. With the push of a branch, the forest ended. Kilo looked out at the waves lapping the shore, the beach, the one place that felt like home. She walked along the water's edge, her canvas bag hanging lightly from her shoulder. When Kila was five, she had found the first piece of sea glass, blue like a cloudless sky. You found a mermaid's tear, Mum had said. Let's try to find a whole rainbow. They had found every color but orange, the rarest. Now, Keela stayed up at night thinking about that last piece, Mum's piece. Keela peeked into her bag at what she had collected that week. Several pieces of sea glass, sharp edges worn away by water and sand. The colors rippled like the surf, translucent green, white, and a piece that glowed golden amber. Her mother had taught her to make jewelry from these gems of the sea. When something caught her eye, she tried to imagine how a person could wear it. A charm hanging from a crocheted necklace, wrapped in wire to make an anklet, she never knew exactly what she was going to make until she got started. In these broken bits of glass, trash to some, Keela saw possibilities. The broken made beautiful. She took out a piece and held it to the sky. Green brightness spilled softly into her hand. She remembered the old island folktale about sea glass. Could sadness really make something so beautiful? Keela! Keela turned towards the voice and her face fell. Her friend Lissy stepped out from the trees and walked to her. How'd you know I'd be here? Keela asked in a low voice. Where else would you be? Lissy replied. But ever since, she paused, her eyes searching the water as if the right words would jump out like flying fish. It just seems like you always come without me now. Keela dropped the sea glass she was holding back into her bag. Lissy was right. Three months ago, they would have been on this beach together. Did I do something wrong? Lissy's brown eyes stared fixed fixedly at Keela. No, Keela said. She shifted her feet. I know things are hard, Lissy said softly. I hear Gran talking with your dad. She looked down. Whatever you're feeling, we don't have to talk about it, but we can if you want. Keela remembered the fun that she and Lissy once had together, exploring the beach, watching the sanderlings scoot along the shore. She pushed Lissy's friendship away, and like diving with Pop, she missed that too. All right, Keela said. Lissy squeezed Keela's hand and pulled a bag out of her own pocket. Did you find any sea glass yet? Some, Keela said with a slight smile, but there's not much here. Let's head up the beach then, Lissy said. The shore snaked before them and the girls followed the tide line, raking the sand, excuse me, with their feet as they looked for treasure. A heart-shaped pebble was the first to disappear into Keela's canvas bag. Small pieces of driftwood, sea beans, and a couple of pieces of sea glass went into the salty folds. She didn't collect shells. Pop had explained how important shells were when she was little. They prevented beach erosion, provided homes and hiding place for animals, and were even food for creatures that lived in the sand. If you want to keep St. Rita beautiful, he had said, leave them where you find them. But sea glass, that was just the sea returning what people had thrown away. 
The jewelry you left with Gran is some of your best, Lissy said. Are you still planning to apply for the creative arts program? I don't know, Keila said quietly. When she first learned of the program for gifted young Caribbean artists, it had seemed perfect. 12 weeks of inspiring classes full of happy, carefree kids, like the kind that she used to be. She changed the subject. What have you been up to, Keila asked. This was the most that she and Lissy had talked in weeks. Oh, the usual, Lissy said, helping Gran in the shop. Business is picking up now that it's tourist season. She lets me help on the register. Lissy's Gran, Miss Innes, sold everything from sunglasses to homemade coconut sweetbread and Keila's jewelry. That makes sense. You're good with math. Keep me company tomorrow, Lissy said. Promise. She stuck out. All she wanted to challenge Keila's teacup manners. Keila wanted to laugh, but her stomach rolled. In her 12 years, she had never broken a pinky promise with Lissy. She hooked her pinky, pinky with Lissy's, I promise. Farther down the beach, they came to a tall wooden fence that extended from the hill to the water's edge. A large sign read, Coral Gardens Cave, no trespassing. They were at the border of one of St. Rita's most beautiful nature parks. Hidden beneath the ground were sea-facing caves, natural rock pools, and a coral floor, but it was also off limits. Not only was their access was the access monitored with security cameras, it was dangerous to enter from this side of the park. Pop had also often warned her that a wrong step on the slippery rocks could mean a nasty gash or even worse, a steep fall and a broken neck. Maybe we'll have better luck tomorrow, Lissy said, kicking the sand and turning back the way they had come. Yeah, Kayla said. She turned too, and then stopped. A faint warbling hum, like the singing of tree frogs, floated on the breeze. She scanned the thick green hillside, but she wasn't sure where it was coming from. What was it? Lissy walked ahead and didn't seem to notice. Do you hear that? Kayla asked. Hear what? That sound. I think it's coming from up the hill. Lissy turned. I don't hear anything. Part of Keelan knew that she should let it go, but the sound called to her. She remembered the stories of magic that Mum had read to her. Lissy couldn't hear it. Maybe it was just for Keela. I want to see where it's coming from, Keela said. Lissy blinked. You mean climb up there? She tilted her head in the direction of the slope. Just for a minute. Keela scrambled up the bank. Watch your step. Keela, Lissy stumbled behind her. We're not supposed to go up there. Keela clambered up the steep hill over the tree roots and the rocks. Her foot slipped, but she grabbed a palm frond to steady herself. The warbling hum trilled again, louder and more insistent. She cocked her head to pinpoint the sound. At the top of the hill, the ground leveled. A tree had fallen on a fence splintering the wood slats and creating an opening into the nature park. Wait, Lissy huffed behind her. Why are you doing this? Lissy was right. Pop would be furious if he knew she was here. And if the park security found them, there'd be in even more trouble. Keela turned to her friend. I have to look. She wished that she could explain, but the feeling refused to be wrapped up in words. It was as if the strange humming sound had flowed over and around the pieces of Keela's broken heart, and her heart wanted more. I hear you. I'm coming. Keela climbed carefully over the tree and onto the other side of the fence. Lissy hesitated and then followed in silent acceptance. A short distance away, Keela stopped. The hum pulsed louder in her ears. The rocky ground had crumbled to form a sinkhole. Faint light glowed from below, and Keela could see rough outcrops of rock that angled down. What's down there? She whispered, crouching low to peer into the pit. Lissy shook her head. You can't. What if you get hurt? I'll be careful, Keela said, turning backwards and inching her way down. Step by slow step, she probed for solid footing and lowered her body into the void. She didn't realize that she'd been holding her breath until her feet touched bottom. She turned and squinted into the expanse of the cave. An angular shape crouched in the sand a few feet ahead. Not rocks, perhaps trash that had washed in from the ocean. 
It rested curiously out of place. Keela, are you all right? Lissy called. Her voice echoed off the cave walls. I'm fine, Keela replied, waving at her friend, who was lying flat on the ground at the top of the hole. Give me a minute. As she focused on the dim shape, the air bit with unnatural cold. Her skin prickled as she stepped gingerly across the sharp rocks. She extended her hand, undecided, and then pulled the object from the coarse grit. The hum stopped. It was a box, a little bigger than the size of her hand and completely battered. Nothing but barnacles and sea-worn wood. Its hinges oozed a rusty red. A tiny keyhole stared from its center. Nothing betrayed its contents as she turned it over in her hands. Keela looked around. When diving, there were rules about what you could take depending on where you were, but she was Still, this was a protected nature park, which meant the box was protected too. A nature park belonged to the people. She was a St. Rutan. What's here belongs to me too, at least in part, she reasoned. Keela felt like she was in one of Mum's folktales. The box breathed a strangeness that she couldn't shake. Small and crumbling, it seemed harmless. Her ears pounded with indecision. Everything else had been taken from her. Yet here was something as lost and alone as she was. And it had called to her, had wanted her to find it. Keela, Lucy yelled again. I'm coming. Keela's fingers tightened around the box and she shoved it into her bag. And I'll stop there. Thank you. And I have a giveaway also that uh, in the form. So please feel free to fill it out if you would like to win a copy of my book. Thank you again. Oh, Lisa, that was marvelous. It only goes to show that you should follow the no trespassing signs. Um, okay. Our final reader is Mia V. Moss. Mia Moss is a speculative fiction writer from the Pacific Northwest, now living in, in the San Francisco area. Her stories have been published in Cat Ladies of the Apocalypse, Starship Sofa, Galactic Stew, and elsewhere. When she's not writing, she enjoys running around the feral outdoors, DMing tabletop campaigns, making cocktails for her friends, and admiring her enormous TBR pile. Mia, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so I also have a book to give away. This is a novella. It's my first novella published just earlier this month on July 12th. Um, and it is called My Ties for the Lost. I'm just going to start at the beginning. Um, it is sort of a noir science fiction. I would call it Yacht Rock Bioshock Noir. So I hope that that is your thing. Um, <clears throat> so November 9th, 2112. It was six in the evening, and the sea above electric blue moon was a riot of storm-tossed flotsam and unlucky fish. The call came in just as I was finishing the first round of a three-glass dinner of seaweed gin at Infinity's Cup, the favorite liquor cabinet of the habitat's young, reckless, and over-moneyed progeny. Infinity Kovac himself was tending bar that night, slinging vintage trashy cocktails to classic house music in the moody purple light. He paused when my calm buzzed next to my hand, the bottle of gin hovering a silent question mark over my empty glass. I glanced at the screen. It was Disco Bishop, my brother Rocket's fiancé. I nodded for Infinity to pour me another and picked up my calm. I could polish off ten drinks before Disco was done talking. Marrow? Marrow, it's Disco. His voice was strung higher than the lofty domed habitat roof. I sighed and motioned for Infinity to leave the bottle. Yeah, I know it's you, Disco. What's the matter? Rocket, he's... Oh, God, Meryl, I don't know how else to say it. Rocket is dead. Disco, baby, what do you mean Rocket's dead? I just saw him not two hours ago. He was fine, perfectly healthy. 
Rocket Nightingale was a force of nature. Young, beautiful, charismatic, wealthy as a king, and generous as a saint. His life was one unbroken stream of flashy parties and delightful adventures. He was also my older and only brother. He wasn't the kind of asshole to turn up dead out of the blue on an otherwise uneventful Wednesday. Someone killed him. I came home to change for dinner party at the Van Houtens, and there he was, sprawled out in the foyer with his skull in pieces and blood all over the tile and God, marrow, the goddamn foyer. He cut off with a choke sob. I tried to find the bottom of my stomach, but it was as though some unseen hand had scooped it out, every ounce of guts, and left me scrambling for nothing but cold emptiness. When I finally found the air to speak, it was as though someone else had taken over my vocal cords. I sounded frosty smooth and alien to my own ears. All right, honey. Stay where you are. Can you do that? I'm on my way now. Fix us both a strong drink while you wait. I... Sure, didn't need another, but it sounded like he could use one. It would at least keep him preoccupied for a while. And Disco, don't call anyone else until I get there, all right? Sure, Mero, no one else. Especially Habsec, I stressed. No cops. Disco knew better than to call Habsec, but a bad shock to the nerves can make people do stupid things. Habitat security goons stomping all over a crime scene, attracting every tabloid and radio range. That was the last thing we needed. I ended the transmission and stood up, pushing the bottle away. Infinity came over to settle my tab, and I held up a hand to stop him. Chances are high. I'm just going to talk this go down off the ceiling, and I'll be back inside an hour, I said. And if not, I'll see you tomorrow. Same time as always, pal. Infinity nodded in time with the music, indifferent to the specifics of the emergency, and moved on to other patrons. I grabbed my things, pushed through the arriving after work crowds, and caught the streetcar heading uptown. Electric Blue Moon isn't the biggest, and it's definitely not the most technologically advanced habitat city in the Pacific, but it is the third oldest and comfortably ranks among the top five wealthiest. It was built and funded by the type of dynastic old money that likes to buy one hulking set of furniture for their mansion and pass it down through the generations, regardless of how out of fashion it is. Half of them are still using the same dead wood furnishings their ancestors lucked down with them to the bottom of the sea. The closets all came pre-lined with skeletons, too. That old money is built into the DNA of this hab. The smell of dusty, hoarded cash perfumes the very atmosphere that circulates through the ventilation, breathed in and exhaled by a hundred thousand souls. It's a hardwood and gilded corners kind of place. A fantasia desperate to recall a surface world myth that never existed in the first place. The electric streetcars even make old-timey, clangy bell noises as they glide through the foot traffic. A serene, synthetic voice announced my stop, and I ran fingertips along the age-worn, authentic wood paneling as I disembarked. The last cedars on the planet had probably been cut down to contribute such finishing touches. When I got to Rocket and Disco's place, I nearly kept right on walking. Habsex security chief security <laughs> Habsex chief security officer Varsity Beckett was waiting outside the gate in his ridiculous turquoise uniform and white skate sailor scarf, looking real anxious to arrest someone for something. I could tell by the way he hefted his meat slab physique off the fence and rested one twitchy hand on his sidearm that he was hoping it would be me. My breath caught for the briefest of moments. If Habsek was already on the scene, but no, my brother had been alive and healthy just hours ago. I could practically still smell his body wash from when he leaned in to tousle my hair as I'd left. I'd been on the comm with a client, and my last gesture to my older brother had been to flip him off on my way out the door. I banished the thought with a scoff. If you're here to see Rocket, evidently you just missed him. I let my shoulder connect with his as I unlatched the gate and continued up the short walkway to the door. Marrow Nightingale, Varsity spat, as though my name itself was a murder charge. So quick with the quips. I've got some questions for you before you go inside. Give me a break, Varsity. I'm here on about a family emergency. (laughs) You just get here? Seems awfully convenient timing, you showing up right after the morgue picked up the body. The body. Disco hadn't been hallucinating. My jaw clenched tight, but I refused to rise to Varsity's bait. 
I was well aware that anything I said would most certainly be used against me in his case write-ups. He'd been looking for a way to get me off the hab ever since he'd picked up his badge. It boils down to this. Electric Blue's got two types of bastards, rich ones and poor ones. There are the wealthy and there are the people who scrub the toilets of the wealthy or do their taxes or sometimes both if they're the kind of poors with the right amount of hustle. When everything went straight to hell topside and the billionaires of Earth took refuge in the sea, they still needed their chefs, hairstylists, concierges, and housekeepers, and their Habsec security chiefs. Many of the toilet scrubbers have worked hard to build little worker bee dynasties of their own, working overtime to ensure their children can live out of harm's way under the oceans. But the threat of deportation to the surface always looms large. Habsec are police, judge, and executioner, and there's two things as Two ways it's going to end for a body if they ever get caught breaking the rules. A hefty fine they'll never work off, or a one-way ticket to the surface. In other words, permanent exile. For you, your spouse, your kids, probably their kids too, just to be thorough. A twist of fate had elevated me, the humble daughter of service workers, out of reach from have sex threats and therefore out of their power. And if there was one thing men like Varsity hated more than anything, it was feeling impotent. I'm sure I don't know what you're insinuating, Officer Beckett. Have you had zero sensitivity training? What in the world are my family's generous annual donations to HAPSEC being used for? I looked Varsity Square in his dull, narrow eyes for one long moment. I held his gaze until his face turned a blotchy shade of red, and he suddenly became interested in the walkway. Yeah, okay. He tried to brush it off, but the tough guy posturing had been thoroughly skewered. He ran a scarred hand through close-cropped, sandy blonde hair. I tell you what, Meryl, the fiancé says you were the last person to see Rocket alive, so you take a few to process your grief or whatever, but I want your butt in a chair at the station giving us a statement within the next 24 hours. After that, I'm putting out a public notice that you're wanted for questioning as a person of interest in a murder investigation. That's sensitive enough for you? I stepped into the house and slammed the door in his face without another backward glance. The foyer was empty. The god-awful yellow marble floor was immaculately clean and newly polished, shining like a well-preserved mustard stain. If I'm being honest, I had expected a lot more dead brother to be there. It hadn't been long enough for health services to collect a body and, and for Habsec to run the full crime scene and clean up after. I breathed in the synthetic white sage floor cleaner, and for a moment I held on to the idea that perhaps Rocket wasn't dead. Maybe the whole thing had been a sick joke after all. And I think my time is up, so I will stop there. Wow, that that is an amazing world you're building there and some terrific stuff happening in it. Thank you, Mia. And thank you so much to everyone who came today.